So let's go ahead and talk about the portfolio from a couple of different perspectives. This is a little tough to see, but I just threw this one in here just to make the point of you know how solid the club has been over the years. This is the portfolio as it appeared in the, the 2001 50th anniversary edition of Better Investing. And you can see that uh, they're investing in a whole bunch of our community favorites going back over the years. From Home Depot to Walgreen to Wolverine. Well, Wolverine's a little bit off track, but uh, we'll, we'll be talking about that here in a few minutes. Pepsi, Hershey's, they obviously like the, the food stocks back there, uh, Coca-Cola. Uh, Homer probably forced him to buy a few shares of A.G. Edwards, the firm he worked for. Just kidding. Um, Cisco Systems, but you can see a pretty broad range from staples to some discretionary stocks to uh, technology and a little bit of healthcare. And again, uh, look down that financial strength column and you can see, by the way, you can see a little bit of my influence because we added these uh, to the, the repair shop back at this time frame. You can see that the, the companies from top to bottom are, are very strong financially and uh, those stock selection guides all look pretty good. You can tell that from top to bottom because their earnings per share predictability uh, approaches 100, certainly in high double digits for most of the companies. And you can see uh, a whole lot of good stuff going on there. Their largest holding at the time was Home Depot at 11.1. So just kind of lock in on some of those names from Home Depot to Medtronic to uh, a few others. I will point out that the ladies were, like many of us in the community, fans of Clayton Homes here. Clayton Homes, which disappeared when Warren Buffett bought the company a few years later. So let's get into the current day portfolio. And again, this is we're going to take our traditional dashboard diagnostics, look at the company, or look at the portfolio and see what the Beardstown ladies have. And here's our report card on the left hand side. You can see the three magic major categories we're going to be taking a look at in the report card. The projected annual return is about 10%. Strong quality rating, strong growth rating could be a little stronger. And very typical, um, the average P-E ratio for the companies they hold is about 16. That's a very typical yield for uh, you know, our conservative community of investors and significant strength when it comes to the financial strength. And again, very strong looking companies in their, their visual analyses. Um, right now, the, the median stock at Manifest Investing, the median stock's projected annual return, that's what my part is, is about 7%. So that means of the 2,500 stocks that we cover, about 1,200 of the stocks are above 7% and about 1,200 stocks are below 7%. So 7% is right in the middle. Why does that matter? Well, we're trying to build our portfolios and maintain our portfolios to stay at least 5% ahead of that. So what you see here is the ladies' projected return of 10%. And our target range for the portfolio would be to be somewhere in the 12 to 17 range. That's depicted here by this, this uh, target range. So you can see that they're not terribly out of range, but you know if they could find opportunities which would improve the overall return of the portfolio, that's what they should be pursuing to try to get in this uh, target range. Second thing, quality. Um, they're right in the zone. They're right here. They're right in the middle of the, the target range. Very typical for a, a better investing influenced investment club. I mean, they, they're, uh, this is a portfolio that's going to stay, stay out of trouble as well as can be expected during a bear market or a large correction. So they're right in that sweet spot. Again, we counsel that you want to be somewhere in that 70 to 80 range. You know, maybe maybe tightening down on the quality if this uh, bull market continues to rage on, but uh, they're certainly in a good spot today. The size diversification of the portfolio is actually pretty good too. Um, there's a little bit of a gap here, but not too bad. Again, we're going to cover this in greater detail in a few minutes, but uh, the target range is to get somewhere in that 10 to 12 percent range by buying companies that are small enough with promising growth characteristics and prospects going forward. So again, the nutshell is uh, they could use a little bit more return, their quality is right on, and they could use a little bit more uh, sales growth when, when they review the opportunities in front of them going forward. Here's what the portfolio looks like from a, a sector standpoint. And you can see that it's, it's pretty well distributed. Uh, we like to see uh, a number of pies that aren't, aren't overpowering. Uh, they do apparently like to shop a little bit. The discretionary has gotten up to be 30% of the portfolio, but they also have 20% in healthcare, 20% in technology. Uh, they do have some financials. We saw AFLAC in there. They've got some staples. 
and uh, their industrial happens to be Fluor, one of the stocks we're going to be talking about tonight. But again, that's a, a pretty solid picture of diversification. Again, going forward, it, the, they should be nudged perhaps away from discretionary a little bit and a little more towards some of the other sectors. But again, that's something to get uh, carried away with, and uh, they're in fine shape right now. Well, here's what you've been waiting for. Here's what they actually have these days in the portfolio. These, this is a one of the manifest dashboards that we have, and uh, Bridgetown ladies range from their largest holding of Wolverine Worldwide at 15.9% uh, of total assets. That's their largest holding, down to a company which maybe we'll get them to talk about a little bit. Our Pets, interesting ticker there, OPCO.OB. It's a very tiny company. But you can see less than 1% of the portfolio is in our pets. So ranging from uh, the largest position of Wolverine at 15.9 down to a, a fairly small position in our pets and everything in between, again, fairly good uh, distribution. Um, uh, even, even the position in Wolverine Worldwide, if, if it's uh, in, in good condition, is not too much to have. Um, in any investment club where they start getting up a little bit higher, we're not going to talk in great detail tonight, but you might watch for opportunities to lighten up on that position. Um, and again, the, the, the stuff on the right-hand side is the major things that we think about. Uh, this is the sales growth forecast for all of the positions in the portfolio projected. That's the long-term forecasted projected PE. Projected yield, the financial strength of the companies, again, 100% would be A++. Uh, C is zero, if you want to think of it in a kind of a value line frame of reference. And earnings per share stability, same thing. Uh, you would expect to find very straight lines from Medtronic and most of the other companies in the portfolio. Uh, Intel, by virtue of its cyclical nature, is a little bit lower. And that also impacts the quality a little bit on, on Intel. Um, and you can see that the overall quality rating is is super. Along, got a couple companies that are a, a little bit lower, and again, they're probably impacted by a cyclicality. The view that we like to take a look at is to take that same uh, dashboard now, and now it's sorted from top to bottom by largest to smallest holding, and actually sort it by clicking on the projected return header. When we do that, it rearranges them and ranks the highest opportunity positions at the very top. So again, if this were our shopping list for going out and looking for stocks within the portfolio, and we're going to do that in a few minutes, um, this is the end of the portfolio where you'd want to focus your study efforts for buying stocks. Down at the other end would be stocks that uh, are potential selling candidates. And by the way, here's, a, here's one that's a fairly local company for them, Hancock Holdings. That's an excellent bank, conservative bank in the central Illinois area. And that's something that they've held since, I believe, the very early days of the investment club. They've also held Wolverine uh, from the early days, and I'm not sure about Floor, but I know that Wolverine's been in the portfolio for quite a long time. We'll be talking about both of these two companies. And, and uh, what we're going to demonstrate is what I see as the, it's an interpretation of the challenge concept put forth by NAIC co-founder George Nicholson. And that, that process is basically to challenge or think about the stocks at the bottom of this sort, that being, in this case, Wolverine Worldwide and Floor. Ken, uh, did you Mark, have a comment or question? Yeah, Mark, we're getting a question. Uh, what would force paychecks earning stability to go to drop all the way down to zero? I really don't know. That's that's got to be an error in the database. I, I have not, I've not seen that. That's that's not right. Um, I'll take a look at it though, and I'll post it in the. The, the forum after the session. All I can think is that some, some, something got accidentally deleted. That's a mistake. Uh, Thank that number you. is pr probably close to 80. Thanks, Ken. Any other comments or questions? We'll press on. Well, let's go ahead and take that first stock towards the bottom that has the, the weaker returns. And what we're going to do now is just demonstrate the, the simple process of uh, don't take anybody's word for it. Uh, you, you really want to check it. When you're looking at these numbers, one of the ways I, I want everybody to always characterize them or think about them is uh, they're not my numbers. They're not Ken Kavula's numbers. What they, are, what they basically represent is a sampling or a consensus of the analyst estimates that are out there. 
So literally, you're looking at uh, a consensus or an aggregate of uh, analyst opinions, and now we basically have to audit them or decide whether or not we agree with them. In some cases, it could be a matter of an update. I know that a couple of these companies are, are very close to an update. Well, let's start with the one at the bottom of the list. This would be the challenge stock, at least the first challenge stock, Fluor. Uh, for those that are not familiar with the company, this is an engineering and construction company, one of the uh, best. Mark, can I interrupt? Be Mark, uh, before sure. you go much further, uh, we're giving a couple people with questions. They want to know how you change the dashboard uh, to sort on different things, just the mechanics of making it sort on different columns. Could you go over that real quickly for a couple of our folks? Sure, and and really what it comes down to is uh, well, let's just pretend that this were the display. We can actually demonstrate this afterwards if we have a little bit of time after the session. But you can sort on any one of the columns. So you can see that. Let me go back one more page. You can see here that uh, um, this is sorted by the, the value or the percent of total assets from highest to lowest. If you were on your dashboard at Manifest Investing and you clicked on quality, if you click, clicked on this header, it would sort everything in the column from top to bottom, highest quality to lowest quality. In this case, all we've done is literally click on this header, this column header par, which will take and rearrange them from highest to lowest, as you see right here. So again, for any dashboard at Manifest Investing, if you click on the column header, uh, again, it's just a form of sorting. It's kind of a form of screening um, that can be done using the, the dashboards. I've seen many people use them in watch lists, and a lot of times they'll take their watch lists uh, dashboards and sort them by quality just to achieve that effect. So again, we've sorted these so that we can focus in on the shopping opportunities at the top and the candidates for potential selling decisions at the bottom. Uh, Mark, one more technical question. Can you explain the difference between the growth column and the PAR column? Okay, um, two separate things. The, the growth, we're going to talk about that for Fluor here in a second. That is the top line uh, sales growth forecast. The projected annual return, and the, again, we can spend more time afterwards. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it here, but the projected annual return is literally the same thing you calculate with a, a stock selection guide, where at, at the very end of the stock selection guide, you have a figure that is the sum of the price appreciations annualized annualized price appreciation plus the annual dividend yield equals the projected return. So the assumptions that you make in your forecast, and we'll be looking at, at a, a demonstration of this, but the projected annual return, again, is the projected price appreciation plus the dividend yield for any, any stock. Okay, here's a look at Fleur. And uh, the first one here, one of the reasons I really like showing this one is, and the ladies know this, um, as an engineering and construction company that gets involved in large capital projects, it's going to be um, vulnerable to economic cycles. Vulnerable meaning it's going to cause fluctuations, ups and downs. And what you see here is, and they're not too dramatic, but I want you to compare these in a few minutes with Wolverine Worldwide when we put it up there. Do you see the gaps here that where the, the green dots are actually offline? Again, it's gapped. It's even gapped out here in the long-term forecast. And really what we care about is the long-term trend through that data. And again, if you want to read up on this, the subjects in the Better Investing Archives, we're talking about a, a cyclical company that's also a growth, known as a growth cyclical. And uh, what, what we would always be looking for is uh, it, even if the growth rate is lower, we still want to see a little bit of growth using that long-term trend and forecast that you see here. In the case of Floor, you can make a case for anything from 7 to 9% for the, the long-term sales growth forecast. Here's a look at the projected annual return we were just talking about. And uh, one of the reasons I want to bring this up is um, the, the ladies have been uh, uh, experimenting with a variety of strategies, and we'll talk about them in a minute, uh, including uh, some conservative option strategies. But one of the things I find very interesting about the floor chart is uh, you have this period back in here. I mean. Well, let me set the stage for this. This is basically about five years of quarterly snapshots. Uh, taking a look at, the first of all, the price. That's the green bars. These are split adjusted and dividend impacted price bars. Um, you can see that they went from a, a price back here in, two, in early 2005 in the high 20s 
up to uh, the high 80s in uh, mid-2008 here. And then it came back down, and, and now it's actually back up in the, the mid-70s range somewhere in here. So that's what the stock price has done. And if you had sat down and done a stock study on the company, every quarter when the value line report came out, going back for five years, you would have the red line. That is the projected annual return. So again, we know that stock prices fluctuate. You know that uh, projected returns have to fluctuate. And in this case, we're using as a proxy, uh, because based on some of our research, uh, the PARs at the end of our studies very often will uh, resemble I'm trying to it's kind of like using an etch a sketch. The PAR will actually resemble the value line low total return forecast. And I have a huge pile of value lines, so I can actually go back and look. But one of the reasons I really like bringing this up is you see this period back in this time frame. And if you look over here to the far right, you can see that those projected returns back in that time frame for a fairly extended period were sub zero. The projected annual returns based on the stock selection guide would have very likely been in this sub zero range. And what I'd like to point out is, you know, we, we came out of a recessionary period, hit a fairly strong period, and look what happened to the stock price on the company. So again, uh, the stock selection guys were not that strong, but this is, again, is a company that's cyclical, and you had an opportunity for an extended period, you know, if you had bought back in here to, to hang on, even though the guys were weak, you may have used uh, a trailing stop loss in those cases. And here's another case where... Uh, Back in the early 2009 time frame, the stock selection guide looked very good. You may have been persuaded to go into Fluor at, at uh, less than $40 a share, and you can see that it has subsequently gone up a fair amount. looks like it may actually be on another one of these patterns. So again, with uh, the projected return actually coming down into this range now, we just want to be kind of mindful of what happened back here and, and just make the point that it is possible for that stock to run even further than you might have normally expected based on based on your study. And again, it's a it's a perfect opportunity to consider something like a trailing stop limit. And again, this is actually a picture perfect condition for you know why that might make sense. And I'm not going to go into you know that's beyond the scope tonight, but just make a make a note of it. We're going to be talking about trailing stop limit orders more and more. Okay, so let's actually take a look at what the current situation does look like at Floor. And what you see here is that is literally a stock selection guide. It's just prevented, presented in a slightly different format. On the left-hand side over here, what you have is a snapshot of the current conditions at Floor, including the stock price, current P-E ratio, um, current uh, profitability measured by net margins, and you can see that it's about a $20 billion company. And so this is the current day snapshot. All we're doing now is taking a look at literally what might this company picture look like five years from now. If it were to grow at 8 to 9%, as we showed from the chart a few, chart, uh, a few slides back, could become a $30 billion company. If they have average profitability at that time of about 2.5%, their earnings per share would be as high as 460 if their PE at that time is is typical of the long-term average for the company, closer to 19, we could be looking at a situation where the annualized price appreciation, which you can see right here, three and a half, adds up with the dividend to a company that has about a 4% projected annual return. So again, that's not something that uh, gets us all excited. Um, in this case, it's uh, probably a hold. And then based on that picture we just had up there, it squiggles on that chart, but it's one that you might want to hang on to because it's it's shown in the past that it can hang in there longer than you might have expected. So again, the summary here is left-hand side is a current day snapshot. The right-hand side is five years from now. Again, five years from now, exactly how we do on stock selection guides. What might the company look like uh, five years from now if it grows at 8 to 9%, if this is its profitability of 2.5%, and... Uh, if the PE ratio is somewhere around 19. So again, um, it, to me it would be a candidate for one of the covered calls that the ladies study or one of these trailing stop limit orders, TSLOs.